Good evening, everyone. I'm Adrian Schenker, Executive Director of Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center, your local LGBT community center right here in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us tonight to hear from John Elizabeth Stinzi, author of Vanishing Monuments, as part of our 2020 queer novel miniseries. During COVID-19, Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center is providing virtual programs, and this program is supported in part by the Pennsylvania Humanities Council, the federal state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Arts and culture programs at Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center are free for the community to enjoy all year long. Uh, however, we welcome your donations if you're able to keep making these programs possible. You can donate right here on Facebook or on our website at bradburysullivancenter.org. For information about upcoming virtual events, please visit bradburysullivancenter.org backslash events. Tonight, we are joined by John Elizabeth Stinzi. Welcome, John. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is, this is such a wonderful thing to have happen in this weird time. So I'm going to be reading from Vanishing Monuments. The first excerpt I'm going to read is just going to be the first, you know, the first few pages. So I don't think it needs any introduction or, or context. Uh, so I'll just go into it. When the doctor calls, I'm standing in my little house in Minneapolis, drinking the microwaved ends of this morning's coffee. And as soon as the doctor says the words about Hedwig Baum, about mother, the girl who runs away comes back into my bones. She takes over like a surfer on a wave of fear. The first thing she does is put down the coffee and move me into the bedroom to grab the old camera from its place atop the cabinet where I keep all my gear. As soon as she makes my hands lift that old coated brass machine, and as soon as she slung it strap around my neck, something that I do most days without her, I know she's built up too much momentum to stop, to stay. This camera, this old Leica three was hers, mother's. The mother whose dementia the doctor is telling me appears to have taken completely her already dwindling capacity for speech. The dementia she's been living with for about half as long as the 17 years she had with me. While the doctor talks into my ear, the running girl pulls out from under the bed the piece of luggage. Luggage I don't think I've used since Jenny and I went to Chicago in 2007 for a talk I was giving on the body as an indirect object in figure-based art. The talk that came after I'd watched the I-35 West Bridge collapse into the Mississippi River from the bridge beside it the 10th Avenue bridge that I was driving across, watching the bridge and Jenny's trust in engineering and infrastructure and our whole world fall out of sight. Luggage I hadn't used since I'd tried to take her away from here to pull her out of that. We've been keeping an eye on her, the doctor says, as the packing continues, and she hasn't spoken, as far as we can tell, in roughly a week. Her responsiveness to being addressed has also decreased. She has had accidents, well, more. This is the first time the running girl has come to usurp my body since I ran away to Hamburg, Germany in 1991 to escape Jenny and the relationship I thought I was in, to try to get away from the me that I'd been living as, which had suddenly felt like a lie. The first time the running girl ever took over completely was when I ran away from mother from Winnipeg with Jenny when I was 17. In the middle of the night, having removed my bedroom with a pry bar, my bedroom window with a pry bar. That was the last time I was there in Winnipeg, almost 30 years ago. That night was the first time the running girl grabbed the camera. The first time that girl got her way. Mother was not speaking then either, but for a different reason. I'm sure I've said things to the doctor. I'm sure I've been asking questions for clarifications. I'm sure some part of me has, but I haven't been there to take note of them. The longer the conversation goes on, the more I've been following the hands, the more I've been using my legs to move my body through the house to let the running girl's hands grab what they want to. Bedroom to bathroom to bedroom to kitchen to bedroom to living room to bedroom. I cannot figure out what to focus on. The hands grabbing from my gear cabinet, a lens for my Hasselblad and my old copy of Ovid's Metamorphoses, that I stole from my high school library, or the doctor who was talking about a recent study about similar aphasia in patients with dementia. I focus on neither and fade into a relative peace, 
focusing instead on the breath in the body until eventually the luggage is zipped up ready, and I'm standing over it with my phone still pressed to the side of my face. I listen to the doctor, but there's nothing, just silence, because the phone call has already ended in one way or another without my realizing. I pull my phone from my ear and the side of my face is left with a rectangle of sweat. I text Karen to tell her that I won't be able to make it to the collective's board meeting, that I have to go out of town. When she calls me a minute later, as I knew she would, I'm stuffing the luggage into the back of my little car. I stop to stare down at the vibrating phone in my hand until it stops, until Karen goes to voicemail. Then I close the trunk and climb in. I know that Karen won't call again, that she's going to rush to my house to try and catch me, to try and get more information from me. But as I turn the car on, I also know there's nothing anyone can do to stop me. The studio is a 17 minute drive away in good traffic. I'll be headed in the opposite direction. As I pull my car away from the curb, not knowing when I'll see this little house of mine, but not really caring about this house at all, I look across the street at Jenny's house. I tried not to look. Every molecule I own was instructed not to look because I knew how much it would hurt. And I knew there was nothing I could do to stop that hurt from coming for me and for Jenny. She will not understand and she will also understand too much. I don't call her to let her know that I'm leaving, that I'm going back to Winnipeg for the first time since we ran away together. I know that if I called her to explain before I'd made it too far to turn back, I'd never make it. And I have to. Some ancient signal has been sent up to rally me back. Some signal has told me that the road to Winnipeg, to mother, will be too overgrown if I stay away any longer. The call from the doctor has proven that it has just turned from late to too late. The running girl has a history of doing things far too late, of running from one burning building into another sparking start. But if I'm going to close any of the windows to my past, if I'm going to fight against the drafts, I have to go back right away, to make it back to mother, to that city, to pretend I've come back just in the nick of time. As I head north toward Winnipeg, I try not to think about Jenny, sitting oblivious in her office, evaluating plans for this highway or that bridge while I drive. I fail. I throw my phone into the back seat out of reach as I look at the clock and imagine her at this moment getting a call from Karen as she drives toward the empty parking space in front of my house, letting her know that her partner has run away suddenly again. While I drive, I keep telling myself not to look back at the phone. And by the time I fail, I'm already too close to Winnipeg to turn the car around. This is happening. Just north of Fargo, parked at a gas station, I finally pick up the phone from the back seat. The sky is dark, spitting softly on my car. There's a voicemail waiting for me from Jenny, six missed calls and a string of texts. It takes all that I have to text her back. I'll call you tomorrow. It's mother. When I turn off the phone, I don't need, then I turn off the phone. I don't need it for directions. I've already memorized the route from all the times I stared at the map and traced my finger along the here to there. From all the times I put the addresses into Google Maps the last few years. From all the times I zoomed in and used the farthest tip of my body to trail all those highways north, all those directions transcribing that journey into me, home. But before I pull out of the gas station, I look down at myself, bound up and packed in black jeans and a dark tee. I go to the trunk and pull out a dress, a bra, and my makeup bag. I ball it all up and go into the station's bathroom and make myself that girl. And the next section I'm gonna read comes maybe 20 pages later, and this is when Alani has made it to the, the care facility where their mother is being, uh, has been living for the last, you know, three or four years, and this is the first time that they've sort of walked through the door. I walk into mother's room, and there she is, a silhouette against the gray light of the window. She's sitting in a chair in a baby blue blouse, and her hair is very short, manageable. Her back is to me. I don't know if she's actually looking out the window, 
And if she is, if anything is registering. I've never seen her stare out a window from behind before. I only ever saw her staring at a window toward me at night, waiting for me to come home. My eyes adjust from the dimness of the hall. I squint, try to make a distinction between her skin and the light. The door behind me closes with a click. I approach, slowly, counting down the tiles between us. As I get closer, my memory of her body minimizes to meet reality. She's so small. Her shoulders are like wire clothes hangers. Her wrists like thumbs wrapped in wrinkled pink leather. Her scarred hands are two collections of raw bubbled webs. The wriggling on her lap, the only part of her that's moving. When I stand over her, I can see that she's wearing a restraining belt that keeps her from getting out of the chair. I stand over her for a while, taking her in, fascinated and hurt. Time has brittled her, 27 years gone, turning her long hair blank white, letting it be chopped off for convenience, make her seem more put together, letting it all be thrown away. No strand of hair on her head was there 10 years ago. I imagine the nurse from the front desk, armed with scissors and grasping those long, drawn out strings of mother's dead cells. I imagine her clipping them all off. I look down at mother and I can smell her, that clean hospital soap smell that lacks any breath of humanity. I can move my hand four inches and touch her shoulder, just four inches and I could break through decades of gone. I don't move. I stand in her soft shadow and forget completely what she used to smell like. I muddle as to how precisely her hair used to tumble down her back, suddenly unsure what color her hair used to be. Standing near her like this, silent, I hear my heart beating and realize the cacophony of her voice is gone. Mother's old camera hangs off my neck. In the perfect dark of the camera's head, the film stands dormant. The camera's eyes jam shut, capped, and collapsed into the body. The camera is a promise weighing down at my belly, the thin leather straps digging into the sides of my breasts. As I breathe in, the camera gets closer to mother. As I breathe out, it gets closer to me. Four inches. I step back quietly, even though I'm sure she can't hear me. I'll come back tomorrow. Someone in this body will. I turn and walk back toward the door, and as I go, I can sort of remember her again. As I near the door to her room, I remember my little hand buried in her tight palm. I remember walking back from the liquor store with an empty wine box on my head. As I get back into the hall, I remember the smell, just a little, of chemicals and sweat and her when she came out of the dark room, exhausted but sometimes smiling. The dark room where faces, bodies, and angles all began to appear on wet, blank paper. At the nurse's desk, I somehow tell her, mother is asleep right now, and make for the door. Mother is asleep, her eyes open. She's enjoying letting the day into her head. As I step out the door into the cool air, I remember when the car stopped outside our house that morning and they carried mother in, the man from Selkirk and Tom, to the bed where she would mumble. I remember the heat of the sun on my skin as I stood there on the lawn and watched. I wasn't wearing shoes. The dew was nearly gone, but the grass was still cool. I could smell it. Mother's hands were limp and one of her slippers sat empty on the sidewalk. The light rising in the gray eastern sky is a false prophet. I get in the car. My bones fit back into the lumps of the seat better than they fit my body as mother's camera floats on the waves of my uneven breathing. As I put the keys in the ignition, I remember the man handing me mother's keys in a bag of her personal effects, her, her purse, her Nikon with her fast 85 millimeter lens, her small coat, and telling me that she should not drive, but that someone should go and pick up her car from the downs. Then he handed me a bag filled with her medication. I turn on the ignition, crank the heat and drive slowly out of the lot and toward her house, away from the home where mother is unaware that I stood, just stood behind her, that I was only four inches away from her. 
I pull away from the home south toward the place where I grew up and ran from, the dark from which my light thirsty stem grew wide, seeking the warmth of the sun. The horizon to the southeast of the city is dark and tall and endless, widening. The waters of the red and the Assiniboine are high enough, but more rain is coming to drown us out. History is too. And the last section I'm going to read comes from about a third of the way through the book uh, and is sort of the origin of Alani's awareness of this monument called the Monument Against Fascism in Hamburg, Germany, which is just a central image of the book and is sort of the reason why they run away to Hamburg when they do, or sort of what they're looking for. But that all was sort of explained here anyway, so I'll just go into it. I first learned about the Monument Against Fascism in March of 1991 from a boyfriend of Karen's a couple hours before she dumped him. His name was Eros, and he and Karen had been dating a few weeks. Karen's interest in him stemmed partly from the novelty of his name, Eros, and partly from the fact that the Minneapolis winter made it hard to meet new people. We met Eros for the first and last time when Karen brought him to an opening for an exhibition in a chilly warehouse where some members of the collective had pieces. I was showing a few prints and Rhea, an installation artist and the third brain of our collective's tri founding triumvirate, had built short bulging phallic sculptures on the floor, which everyone tripped over less the drunker we got. When Eros and Karen showed up, Rhea refused to shake his hand. Rhea saw men as significantly lesser beings, and nearly all of her work externalized that. The unavoidable phallus was almost always a central image in her work, which I always respected, even though she was the kind of feminist who thought genitals were key to defining a person. As I grew bolder in presenting myself on occasion as a man, that belief became, became one of several major tensions between us. By the time Karen arrived, we already knew that she planned to break up with Eros after he drove her home. She had kept dating him an extra week because she didn't have a car and she wanted to make sure she had a ride to the show, not wanting to try and trust the bus like Jenny and I did. Eros was short and quiet with dark hair, long eyelashes, and a square jaw. A few weeks before, Karen told us that he worked, he worked for the city as an assistant to the public art manager. Karen gagged when she said the words public art. When Karen introduced Eros to us, he smiled. I've heard a lot about you all, he said, unzipping his coat in the cold warehouse, then zipping it back up. As soon as we were introduced, Rhea, Al, Jenny, Karen grabbed Jenny by the arm and followed after Rhea, leaving me with Eros. At first, he took a quick step to follow them, then stopped abruptly and looked over at me, as if he were about to ask me what he should do next. I felt a kinship with him with the way he moved and was unable to move, with how I knew his fate. Women, I said to him, pointing a thumb and shaking my head. Karen spent most of the night hanging out with Jenny and I ended up talking to Eros. We wandered through the exhibit and I asked him questions I knew the answers to. And he told me how he aspired to climb the ladder until he had the power to commission public art. While we wandered past explicit, queer art of all mediums in a non-venue far from the center of things, navigating a smattering of phallic sculptures on the floor, sipping wine. Eros talked about being involved in making art as accessible and approachable as possible to a general public. He felt it was important to connect people and mend the wounds of society through art. Then Eros started to talk about monuments about the monument against fascism that he'd studied in a class on public memory in university. The monument against fascism was a 12 meter tall, one meter wide aluminum column clad in a thin layer of lead that was installed in Hamburg, Harburg, Germany in 1986. The point of the monument was to let people inscribe their names with metal styluses tethered nearby and pledge themselves against fascism. Once the section of the monument within reach was filled up, the column would be lowered farther into the ground so as to offer a fresh canvas. Eros said the monument was already halfway gone. The point is that the monument won't be there forever. Once it's gone, vanished, 
the people will be responsible for keeping up its memory. I'm not sure that a monument that disappears works, but it's interesting. I couldn't help but feel sad at the irony of a vanishing boyfriend telling a guy he'd probably never see again about a vanishing monument. I couldn't help but feel sad about how part of me didn't really want him to vanish, not because he was particularly interesting, but because of how, he, how much he reminded me of Tom. I felt that Eros carried himself with a similar resignation to being a man, as if he knew he was a man, that it was fine, but it wasn't really all that important to him. I always had a sense that Tom was uninterested in trying to defend or police being a man, in himself or in others. It was what he was, not what he was invested in. I think Eros already knew something was up with Karen, but had resigned himself to that fate too. We met back up with our girlfriends after maybe an hour. Rhea continued to ignore and avoid us. I got tipsy enough to trip over the sculptures on the ground less. Everyone got tipsy enough to be comfortable in the world we were in. To forget, maybe, the time was so limited. That, like monuments, people could also vanish into nothing but a fading stain in the brain. Like the fog of our breaths in that cold warehouse air. At the end of the night, Eros offered to give Jenny and me a ride home. We crammed into the cab of his three-seater pickup. Karen sat in the middle and Jenny sat across our laps yelping quietly whenever the truck hit a bump. I couldn't see Eros as he waved over dark ice and snow, slipping occasionally but not crashing. We all talked, but we didn't talk about anything. I never saw Eros again. When he dropped Jenny and me off, I got out of the truck first, and as I started making my way to Jenny's door in the sub-zero night, she grabbed my arm and held me to wait on the sidewalk with her. The door to the truck was slightly ajar, and the windows were too foggy from breath to see through. It had started to snow, transforming the moment into one that felt too much like Winnipeg. After a minute, Karen climbed out of the truck and closed the door behind her. Eros pulled away. She looped her arm in Jenny's and dug her chin into her scarf. Before we walked into the, into the oasis of Jenny's apartment, I looked over to see the taillights disappearing into the falling snow a few blocks down. Karen never mentioned Eros again. She got into a new relationship a month later with a man she'd sold drugs to, who ended up stealing from her before breaking her heart. I didn't think of Eros much after that night, but I'd find myself thinking of a monument being lowered into the ground, of the challenge to remember things removed from view. I would think of Eros again the day the past rushed up to meet me, to undermine me, when the running girl came back and decided that she would go somewhere far, far away, when she decided that monument was something she wanted to see. Thank you. Wow, that was such a, a wonderful a reading. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, your your book deals with so many different uh, ideas, but one idea that really strikes me is the the concept of remembrance uh, and the concept of um, of of memory as an active decision. Ocean Vuong, uh, queer poet Ocean Vuong, says that memory is a choice, and so I'm wondering, like I, I that that was something I was thinking about as you were reading. Uh, in each of your readings. I, I, want, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to the, you know, kind of the ideas about remembering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, the book is so much about memory. I mean, that's sort of the, like at, at its core, it's about kind of the instability of memory and sort of the instability of identity and how those things crash together uh, in many ways. But yeah, I think that that's a very, you know, memory as a choice is a very good quote to sort of think about this book as well, because so much of, how Alani sort of has to deal with moving forward is having to sort of realize how much of a choice they have to make in terms of, you know, there, you know, in terms of traumas and like things that have happened to you and like things that you've done, like you kind of have to just, you can't really do anything about it except like look at it and be like, yeah, I did that. Or like, yeah, that happened to me. And like the only really way to, you know, I think that, you know, there's a there's a part that I read where uh, at the beginning it talks about um, how it's just turned too late kind of for them to go back and that they have to pretend that they've come back just in the nick of time. 
and sort of the book is i think at its core kind of about like how you kind of just have to manufacture whatever closure you want by just deciding making a decision to just sort of trick yourself into thinking that things are closed which i think is calls to that question uh, i'm wondering you know so much of queer literature is categorized by the book industry as like you know, this is lesbian fiction, this is, this is trans fiction, this, you know, it's, it's very, um, like, put into boxes in a way that, you know, many in our community have, you know, have, have struggled with for our own identities. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about how your, your own queer identity and the identity of some of the, uh, the, the, the people in the book, um, you know, might speak to, you know, what your hopes are for this book. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I found the most sort of difficult, I think, in sort of the, just the perception of the of queerness in the queer community is that there were all of these sort of boxes and I didn't quite figure out the ones that I fit, fit cleanly enough in to feel like I was real. And I think that, you know, if anything, I, I'm hoping that this book kind of is just convoluted and human and sort of spills here and there. And I don't know, I, I want it to be really complicated in the way that Alani moves through the world. Like I, I think that the characters hopefully feel kind of, you know, I mean, they're like non-binary, they're kind of gender fluid, but like, I think that there's just, I, I was really not trying to, to write it with a sort of idea of like a box, cause that's not something that I'm interested in and that I feel like I've, I've been really harmed by the idea that I needed to fill in for a box. Like, I feel like that held me back for so long. And actually, like, sort of, not to plug myself again, but this, my book of poetry just came out as well. But this book is really about, I like, at its core, like, the June Bat is sort of an, an invented box that I make uh, for myself. And, and it is this hugely contradictory uh, creature throughout the poem. So I think that, you know, I was very much, that's very much something that I've been thinking about a lot and working through is, like, trying to sort of, you know, throw some elbows and make some more space for just being unsure and being kind of, you know, floppy about that sort of stuff. Cause I think that, you know, and, and the, the instability of identity idea, like I don't feel like certainty is something that feels very weird to me, especially in terms of talking about identity. Like I don't feel like that you're like concretely one thing and that's who you are forever. Like, I don't know. I have a much more uh, existentialist sort of view of that. I think, I don't know. Uh, can you share a little bit about some of the queer writers who either inspire and or energize you as a writer? Yeah, I, one particularly that I, I think would be really interesting for probably a lot of the Allentown sort of like outside the center queer people is T. Fleischman. Uh, and they just had a book come out last year, an essay called Time is the Thing a Body Moves Through. And it's just, and it's very much also to this conversation about like boxes and how weird and stupid kind of somewhat all of these things are when you really kind of get into the nitty gritty of it. I mean, I think they're helpful in order to sort of get you in the direction of figuring out stuff. But I think that there's a there's an idea that you have to fit in that, which doesn't really make sense to me. And, and T, you know, in that book is just everything you know they talk about how they don't really even identify as trans or queer really like how they kind of push back against even like using those terms on themselves because of how they kind of i don't know they they, they aren't helpful in this way and that, i just found that really exciting and they also talk about like you know rurality like going to like kentucky and stuff like that and just being kind of on the fringes of not being like this you know new york city queer experience, which seems to be what most people kind of think about, but there's all this sort of, I don't know, beautiful writing about the places that aren't New York. I mean, there's some New York in there as well, but I don't know. I just thought I, I was so just enraptured by that book because it also like flows formally between like verse and, and prose and it's just sort of indefinable in, a, in just a really beautiful way. It just contains so much just wonderful stuff. So that's, that's the one that I think has been the most exciting to me for the past few years, or since like last year, I guess. The, the process of, of writing um, your, your novel and also your, your book of poetry and getting published uh, is a, you know, a challenging process for a lot of writers. So I'm wondering if you could, if there's any advice you might share to 
uh, aspiring writers who might be watching this event today and, you know, uh, might be looking to you as someone that has gone through this? Yeah. Oh, that's, there's no good advice except for just focusing on the, the stuff that you can control and, and putting most of your efforts there. I mean, you know, even with, in terms of this year, like I was getting all ready to go on book tour with two books and like, it was a re really nice, like robust tour. And like, I was spending most of the early part of this year trying to figure this out. And then as soon as in like after in early March, when I decided I wasn't going to go to AWP, I suddenly realized, Oh, every single event that I'm going to do is going to be canceled because of the pandemic. And I sort of realize how little all of that has to do with me and how little control I have over any of that. And it goes the same for like submissions and stuff. And I just went back into writing and it was like, it saved my life. And I think that a lot of the problems that I've had, like the hardest times I've had in, in these sort of submission moments or these sort of like trying to break out is just like fixating too much on that and not really like anchoring myself in like the work that I actually am really passionate about. And I think just just trying to constantly sort of check yourself and be like focusing, I mean, putting your, putting your, as much of your anchor as possible in like the actual work and the actual stuff that you can control. Cause you know, it's a lot of luck. It's a lot of just, sometimes you just have to wait a few years before people think that you're worth publishing. I mean, that's just like, you know, with my experience, like there's been many like stories and poems that I just, failed to publish for years and then now have gotten like awards and stuff. So it's like, it just, you, you never know when something is going to suddenly click and it takes a while sometimes even to like build up enough of a reputation that people just, I don't know, publishing is weird and it's not something that you should be uh, staking too much of your identity in and taking too much of your like mental health in. And I know it's way easier to say that than it is to practice it. And I personally, also get really caught up in that a lot too but um nothing is better than writing and like even and once you get into publishing you realize like oh yeah this, this is not as much fun as writing so just f find your j enjoyment and your fulfillment through that as much as possible and you'll be fine could you hold up the book cover again actually if you want to hold up both books uh even but um so vanishing monuments uh and june bat and uh um do you have any suggestions about where folks might go to get copies of the book? Yeah, I mean, I would say like any like indie that is near you that needs the business, like right now is like a hard time for a lot of small businesses. And I totally encourage you to, you know, buy it from an indie bookstore you love or from an indie bookstore that someone you love loves. Um, or bookshop.org gives a in, lot of money. In to, the Lehigh Valley, we have uh, Let's Play Books, which partners with our community center. So that's a, yeah. a great option for a local bookstore. And you were mentioning bookshop. So we also have a link in the chat right now as well, where um, you can buy uh, both of these books on bookshop.org. A percentage will go to independent bookstores and a percentage will go to Bradbury Sullivan Center to support these arts and culture programs. Yeah, yeah. Those are, those are pretty much the best places you can get them. Um, and I mean, also from the publishers, if you wanted to just look them up, this is Arsenal Pulp Press, who's an amazing queer. I mean, they publish all of the good, the best trans books comes out <laughs> come out of Arsenal Pulp and then House of Anansi. But I would say, yeah, definitely, you know, Bookshop is a great, you know, because it supports you guys and it supports everyone. And and, it, and if it come if it happens that you, it's totally inaccessible for you, you can get it through the the, the devil site if you have to. But I prefer Wait. it to to support someone that as a local community center. We always encourage buying local and supporting our local, our local businesses as well. So, yeah. um, so I just want to first off, thank John so much for, uh, for joining us as part of the queer novel mini series this year. And, um, I want to thank once again, Pennsylvania humanities council, because they provided a grant that made this possible as part of their pop-up grants for cultural producers, uh, to ensure that, that Pennsylvania residents have virtual, opportunities for community engagement with arts and culture during uh, COVID-19. So we're really grateful for their support. So thank you to them. And we want to make sure that uh, our community in the Lehigh Valley, our queer community, knows that we have many virtual programs to stay connected. It's very easy to feel isolated and alone during this time. And um, our center has support groups, community groups, and virtual cultural programs, as well as virtual youth programs as well. Uh, you can get more information about all of our virtual programs at BradburySullivanCenter.org. 
And once again, our arts and culture programs year, year round are free for the community. Um, it's part of our mission is to make these programs accessible. But for those who are able to afford a donation, uh, your donation helps to make more of these events possible in the future. Uh, and donations can be made right here on Facebook or on our website at BradburySullivanCenter.org. So thank you all for joining us tonight. The rest of this mini series is also going to be really fun. So we hope to see you back for the other, the other book talks. Have a great night.